Preface and Chapter One of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Preface and Chapter One. Tell me about a bear. What kind of story do you want? Tell me about a bear. That was our answer when you and I were boys. Our fathers would in all likelihood have said, Tell me about Indians, but for half a century the bear story has been the first choice of the little folks, and this accounts largely for the universal popularity of Teddy B and Teddy G. It is simply the crowning by the children of their very own heroes. This new story supplements the two volumes which told the history and adventures of Teddy B and Teddy G at home. It will be followed by a fourth book, in which these two bears play the role of detectives and solve for the children the old-time puzzles and mysteries of the nursery. Seymour Eaton, Lansdowne, Pennsylvania The Roosevelt Bears on the Atlantic The Roosevelt Bears had their winter sleep, were mountains high and valleys deep, and boulders big and evergreen make the prettiest home that was ever seen. They had carried back to their cave out west ten trunks filled full of things the best, mechanics' tools and books to read, and boxes of candy on which to feed, and toys and rugs and New York suits, and maps of the world, and steamship routes, and a tambourine and a phonograph to play for friends and make them laugh. But the things they did that winter cold have not been written and will not be told said teddy g when spring came round i'm going to quit this hunting ground and travel again i like the sport i want to go to some foreign court to see a king and to try my hand at things that i don't understand if i remember said teddy b you've tried your hand from a to z at things you didn't know before and some few left you pretty sore but if you'll behave this time for sure, I'll join you on a foreign tour. Teddy G. made promise in his way to keep out of mischief and the law obey. But this solemn promise he meant to keep only just while he was sound asleep. They packed their bags that very day and took special train, the papers say, with private car and porter's six to keep them from their old-time tricks. They crossed the country at record rate, and reached New York a minute late. They got their steamer whose captain roared to hold the ship till they got aboard, and off across the Atlantic wide went the Roosevelt Bears to the other side. But there's many a slip between cup and lip when you're out on the sea on a wobbly ship. It beat the fun in the district school, or getting degrees on the Harvard mule, or climbing the pole at the county fair, or learning to balloon high up in the air, to see those bears roll out of bed, and tumble on deck, paws overhead, and climb the stairs like circus clown, with the stairs on edge or upside down. But the biggest laugh was on Teddy G., when he asked the steward for a cup of tea, with something in it strong and stout, to keep him from turning inside out. He was sitting on deck in a steamer chair, as cross and ugly as a Russian bear, and wishing for home and his mountain cave where rocks and trees and the ground behave. The steward came by with tea and cake, which Teddy G. reached up to take, when a mountain wave, both big and high, hit the side of the ship and made things fly. The deck was strewn with chair and bear, and steward and dishes everywhere. When things got level, Teddy G. got up, and asked the steward for another cup. "'I'm not yet level inside,' said he. "'I'm wibbly-wobbly like the sea, and the more I eat, the worse I feel. But it takes much eating to count a meal, for things don't count for me or you which feed the fishes in the ocean blue.' But by and by the weather cleared, and the bears went up on the bridge and steered or went below with stoker men who shoveled coal from six till ten or played some prank on the steamer cook when hunting cakes or pies to hook or looked through glasses to see a wreck 
or engaged in games with boys on deck, it didn't take long for Teddy G to get busy at tricks quite new at sea. He borrowed the bugle and blew a tune, which called the dinner an hour too soon. He locked six stewards in a room, and played at shuffleboard with a broom, and got the clocks going on the run to make them time with the speeding sun. He rang ten bells one night at nine, which meant, he said, that the night was fine, and a thousand things, the sailors say, which made the folks merry every day. While Teddy G. made laugh and fun, Teddy B. wrote letters to everyone, to boys and girls whom he had seen in cities and towns where they had been, and he told them all about the trip and the things they do on board a ship. One day to the captain's cabin they went, with books in hand on questions bent. "'A question, Captain,' said Teddy B. "'May I ask a question in geography?' The captain nodded and touched his cap. "'Are these meridians on this map on top of the water or down below? And who put them there? And is it so that whales get caught when hunting food in these parallels of latitude?' "'And I want to ask,' said Teddy G., "'if mermaids live down in the sea, "'and where the locker that holds the bones "'of fellows caught by Davy Jones, "'and how big the log and the kind of wood, "'and the knots in an hour when the weather's good, "'and if sailors' yarns are ever lies, "'and if boxing the compass is exercise, "'and how many wheels on the captain's gig, "'and the meaning of scuttle and lubber and brig.' The captain laughed and wished them well. But questions, he said, I can never tell which way to answer fore or aft, wind or lee, and again he laughed. They landed in Ireland at break of day, going off on a lighter and up the bay, and waving messages of every kind to friends on the steamer they left behind. As they touched their feet on the island green, the prettiest girls they had ever seen and a dozen boys and an Irish band gave them welcome to the land. The girls showered shamrocks on Teddy G, and the boys gave shalalas to Teddy B. Two blackthorn sticks, one for each bear, to use in England when they got there. Then off they started the sights to see, from Blarney Castle to Killarney. They got into mischief at every turn, and in half a day had fun to burn. End of Preface and Section 1 Recording by Hannah Mary Chapter 2 of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Twinkle The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton Chapter 2 The Bears in Ireland The Roosevelt Bears brought suits of green and the gayest waistcoats ever seen and dressed themselves from head to toe like Irish lords at an evening show. For said Teddy B., I've read at home of a man who traveled once to Rome, and there he followed customs new, and did the things the Romans do. But Teddy G. didn't live by rule. He was out for fun, and he'd play the fool. Or be a duke, he didn't care. For clothes, he said, don't make a bear. In half a day he had learned to say, it is, for yes, in the Irish way. And Begora it was, and bedads it's through. And the saints preserve us, and bad luck on you. While Teddy B. could say by heart, when he had first lines to get a start, the poems and songs of Thomas Moore, the Irish bard of rich and poor. To Blarney Castle and Jaunting Car, the driver said it wasn't far. They went that day their respects to pay. To the Blarney Stone, which the Irish say, If you kiss just right as you kiss your wife, Your words will be sweet throughout your life. But to kiss just right, said Teddy G, Is an Irish trick 
too smart for me. I had tumbles enough on the steamer deck, and I don't intend to break my neck. But kiss we must, said Teddy B. We both need Larney, you and me, and some for gifts, for I'm sure there is none, at the present time in Washington. With the help of Pat, he drove them out. They got a rope, both long and stout, and each the other pulled alone, hand over hand, to the Blarney stone. But Teddy B., each time he tried, approached the stone from his bottom side, and once he slipped clean through the knot, and down to the ground like a ball he shot, and as he rubbed his underbones, he said some things about Blarney stones, which sounded neither sour nor sweet, but which Pat nor his horse didn't dare repeat. But like Bruce's spider of years gone by, Teddy B. would try and try and try, till at last he landed right and to, and got Blarney enough to see him through. Then off they went from place to place, buying shillalas and Irish lace, and driving donkeys at rapid pace, and riding on trains quite new to bears, and counting money to pay their fares, in shillings and pence and sovereigns bright, which mixed them up from morn till night. The landlord asked them why they came, and what their trick, and in whose name and if they favored this or that, the peasant class or the aristocrat. T'was Teddy G. that made reply, with a puckered mouth and roguish eye. Be dad, said he, you wait and see. We're on the ground to set Ireland free, to give her farms, their turf and toil, to the rightful owners of the soil, who, by the sweat of honest brow, have earned the clay they've learned to plough and to make the transfer here and now. But Teddy B. spoke up and said, The plans which I have in my head, about home rule and the landlord ring, I'll present in London to the king. We're here this week, as you will see, to set the Irish children free, and to give a treat to lass and lad, the jolliest time they ever had. Away to the north they went one night, to the giant's causeway to see the sight, and explore the caves where the Irish say, the giant, big and old and gray, who made these famous steps of stone, lived in these seaside caves alone. In Dublin they had fun to spare. They got into mischief everywhere. Teddy G. climbed high to carve his name on a monument to Nelson's fame. And there he carved in letters bold, as big as the window sill would hold, Ireland expects each man that's true to live for Ireland and his duty do. But a policeman caught him by the feet and dropped him down to Sackville Street. He landed right with nothing broke, but the bobby didn't see the joke. He took a trip to O'Connell's grave, a man now numbered with the brave. They saw the homes where more was born, and other men whose names adorn the pages of the books of time, who live in battle, prose, and rhyme. Said Teddy G. at Killarney Lake, to a lad who sold potato cake, How much for a hundred crisp and brown, and a tin of milk to wash them down? The lad replied, Sir, I don't know. A hundred cakes take a lot of dough. They're tuppence apiece, and good and hot, and the milk you see is all I've got. The bears were hungry, they brought the cake, and the milk in the tin they said they'd take. Then the lad, he drove them round the lake, and took them to see where he lived alone, in a thatched roof cottage built of stone. With this Irish lad they spent the night, and by the fire of turf and candlelight, they sat for hours in stories told of their mountain home and the hunters bold, and the trip they made and the fun they had, and the things that happened, good and bad. They gave the lad, when they left next day, a purse of gold, enough to pay, for a suit of clothes and shoes and hat, and ten shillings more for his Irish cat. 
They spent three days at an Irish fair, and got into mischief everywhere. But they finished their Irish trip one night by shutting themselves in a castle tight, by a full mistake of Teddy G, who locked the door with a Yankee key. End of chapter two. Chapter three of the Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Chapter three. The Roosevelt Bears in Scotland. When Dublin Castle door swung wide, and let the two bears get outside, said Teddy G to the keener stout, who unlocked the door and let them out, I've read of wars and famous men on the four stone walls of your musty den, but not a thing could we find to eat, and not to drink, nor bed, nor seat. We're the hungriest bears you ever saw. Get us some food either cooked or raw. We've been locked up for a week or more, and our insides are pretty sore. I'll pay the price, as you can see, in Yankee money or pounds S.D. At this he brought to the keeper's sight two paws filled full with sovereigns bright. This did the trick, the victuals came, some Irish stew and roasted game, and a dozen things they couldn't name. And as they left and said good-bye, they praised the Irish to the sky. The biggest heart and the sweetest smile were always found on the Emerald Isle. And now for Scotland, land of heather, fens and lochs and rainy weather, the folks turned out in the town of Ayr to get a glimpse of a teddy bear. For the news had spread o'er glen and moor that the bears would stop at Ayr for sure. And stop they did, for said Teddy B, we've come to Scotland just to see where Bobby Burns lived when a lad, and to see what kind of home he had and on to read each song and learn the tune on the banks and braes of bonny doon i'll do the singing said teddy g and the dancing too leave that to me i can do a clog or the highland fling or a scotch scottishy or anything and a dance they had in the town of air while crowds of children lined the square and the brig a doon a fiddler blind a scotchman canny old and kind was asked by teddy g if he would loan his fiddle for an hour to see a jig or two in Scottish airs, danced and sung by teddy bears, would bring the crowd and money make for the fiddler blind to his home to take. But the fun they made in clog and tune was a stunt quite new at the Brigadoon. There was cakewalk, sue, and Yankee doo, and things well known to me and you. The crowd had came, they knew the airs, and recognized the Roosevelt bears, and thought of home across the sea, and shelled up money quick and free and said to Teddy's B and G, You're each a chip of the Teddy tree, and are masters of diplomacy. On a Glasgow street they met a lad, a Scotchman's son, in blouse of plaid, who had walked for miles round everywheres while hunting for the Roosevelt bears. Well, here we are, said Teddy B, and this is my classmate Teddy G. We're looking, too, we want a guide to take us up a mountainside. We'll pay you well, and by the mile, if you land us safe on Ellen's Isle. Which way, he said, I dinna ken, if teeny bears hae clays like men. But if ye're the lads, dod I, I'll go, and every place I ken I'll show. And can I wheel each place of fame, and wee MacGregor is my name? Then off they went, the jolliest three, Scotch lochs and bends and glens to see. But the fun they had both day and night would take a hundred days to write. They found where young Prince Charlie hid, a rocky cave with a stone for lid. They searched in glens to find Rob Roy, who they supposed was yet a boy, in huntsman's dress and trappings queer, with hounds and horn out chasing deer. They through the famous Trossachs tramped, and for a night in the glen they camped, with pipers too who were there to play, as the tourist coach went by each day. The bears dressed up in kilts and plaid, and everything the pipers had, and marched in front of coach and four, and blew Scotch airs till their lungs were sore, and held their caps as the coach went by, to catch the silver folks let fly. Then off they went to Loch Katrine, the prettiest lake they'd ever seen. 
and to Ellen's isle from Silver Strand, while we MacGregor lent a hand, and pulled the oars and stories told of Roderick Dhu, the chieftain bold. In Edinburgh the following day the bears were feeling somewhat gay, and Teddy G to show his skill, and to view, he said, the castle hill, climbed hand over hand without being caught, a monument to Walter Scott, to the very top when he called back, Three cheers, I say, for the Union Jack. While we MacGregor up halfway replied, Dot I, you're there to stay. Ye might as well yell out fair bail, for when do you come ye go to jail? End of chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Roosevelt Bears Abroad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rachel. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Samer Eaton. Chapter Four The Roosevelt Bears at Stratford on Avon. Said Teddy G to the judge that day, when taken to court, a fine to pay. Your honor, sir, when you want some fun, come over the sea to Washington, and climb to the top, hand over hand, the biggest monument in the land, and wave to the south and north and west, the stars and stripes of flags the best. And if we know twas fun you meant, you won't be fined a single cent. But the judge looked wise and very grave, and said, In Scotland folks behave, and keep from tricks, and are only gay on the afternoons of Saturday. You owe it to Sir Walter Scott that you pay a fine right on the spot. The court demands that you show your skill by climbing up steep Castle Hill, with a heavy load, about a ton, Scots, poems, and novels, every one. This is to remind you in years to come, that a fool with poets is going some. Teddy G. was quick to make reply. I thank you, judge, and your fine I'll try. If your town police will clear the track, I'll get the books upon my back, and do your fine my very best, without a stop or fall or rest. The streets were lined to see the run up Castle Hill, and to enjoy the fun. The books were piled on Teddy G., armfuls of novels and poetry, and up on top to hold them down sat wee MacGregor like circus clown. One, two, three, go, said Teddy B, and off on a run went Teddy G, with children laughing everywhere at the comic sight of a teddy bear, balancing books and a boy in air, and gripping the rod with paw and toe and going as fast as he could go. Said Teddy G at the landing spot, I've had enough of Walter Scott, and some to spare, he's heavy stuff, he wrote too much, I've had enough. To wee MacGregor a purse he gave, and said, In future you behave, and when you're out on a pleasure bent, don't climb a poet's monument. From Edinburgh they went that week to Stratford Town on Even Creek, stopping en route at Windermere, and other places quaint and queer. Old Chester with its Roman wall, and Shrewsbury with houses small, and rugby school to spend the day, and see the boys their football play, and Warwick with its gates and towers, and Kenilworth, where they stayed for hours, viewing ruins in ivy dress, and reading stories of good Queen Bess. T'was six at night when they got within the ancient walls of Shakespeare Inn, and to their room on the second floor, with Hamlet painted on the door. But when they saw the happy way the rooms are named, each for a play, said Teddy B., not this for me, put me to sleep in Richard III, where I can dream of ghosts and worse, and cry my kingdom for a horse. You may sleep alone, said Teddy G., that room's not gay enough for me. Put me in Romeo and Juliet, if that number isn't taken yet. Said both these bears to themselves that night, as they pulled the clothes around them tight, we're studying Shakespeare now for sure, and are up to our necks in literature. And when next day their meals to eat, in As You Like It each took a seat, said Teddy G, I know this play, I'll act it well six times a day. But they did more Shakespeare play that week than was ever seen at Avon Creek. They took three boys from the grammar school to act as jester, page, and fool. And with these lads they made the rounds of all the houses, haunts, and grounds, 
where Shakespeare played, a barefoot kid, and heard the things folks said he did. From the time he saw the light of day, on Henley Street to Hathaway, where quite grown up a brave young man, he loved a farmer's daughter, Anne. They saw the school where he studied Greek, and chucked his lessons twice a week, to fish or swim in Avon Creek. They crossed the bridge old Clopton made, and to the church a visit paid, where all that's left of William's bones is buried deep beneath some stones. But the fun they had, these three boys say, would make another Shakespeare play. One evening on the public square, to please the crowd, each teddy bear dressed himself in character. Teddy B. as Hamlet, grave and sad, in clothes that fitted pretty bad, and Teddy G. trying hard to laugh, in a Falstaff suit too big by half. They made some jokes about Avon's bard, and quoted Shakespeare by the yard. The mercy lines and the lines to be, or not to be, and Antony, and the tears you have you shed them now, and the lines where Shylock made the row, and about ambition and the world's a stage, and you'd scarce expect one of my age, and Jack and Jill in the light brigade, and things that Shakespeare never made. But they strung it off at a lively rate and called it Shakespeare up to date. But better fun than Shakespeare wrote was made in the park at Charlecote, when Teddy G. one evening clear tried the Shakespeare trick of poaching deer. The deer put horns under Teddy G. and made him look like twenty-three. But the things that happened in that park, that very night well after dark, will be told about another day. Continued in our next, as the papers say. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Twinkle The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton Chapter 5 The Bears Meet King Edward said teddy g at the shakespeare inn as he told the clerk where they had been those deer that live at charlecote have busted buttons off my coat and ripped the sleeve and tore my pants and made me do the skidoo dance they're shakespeare deer and that's a fact they nearly did the brutus act when in turn i wish you'd get my clothes in romeo and juliet and patch them up and buttons fix, and have them ready at half-past six, and shine up shoes and everything, for we go to-morrow to see the king. The clerk gave orders of command, as a half-crown slipped into his hand, and said, Good night, these things will do, will make you look as good as new. The following day in Oxford town, they asked a boy in cap and gown, to show them, if he could, the way, to find the boys from U.S.A. For I have a letter, said Teddy B., from a fellow here whom I want to see. He's a western lad, a scholar, too. Not very big, but he can do more college lessons in a week, writing Latin and reading Greek, than was ever known, and prizes take, since good King Alfred burned the cake. I'm not that fellow, the lad replied, but I'm a boy from the other side, and should like today to be your guide, to show you all the things we do when we paint the town in red, white, and blue. But the hour they spent seemed like a week. The pranks were Latin, the tricks were Greek, and only a joke just here and there was plain enough for a Roosevelt bear. The lunch they served had science for tea and crumpets made a philosophy. When lunch was through in the college hall, the Yankees gathered one and all, and marched to the train, the bears in front, doing the American snake dance stunt. They stopped at Henley to get a meal, and try the food at the Catherine wheel, 
for said teddy b this english air makes me hungry as a bear and those things you ate in oxford town are still in my throat and won't go down they saw the course where rowers win and went themselves for a little spin and gave when they stopped a college yell for harvard penn and old cornell and then to windsor where they were due that afternoon at half past two they entered at the castle gate built tis said by henry eight and as to keep her tall and stout if the king had left his latch-string out for you should know said teddy b we're here to call on his majesty to see his house and barn and land and wish him well and shake his hand the answer came twas stiff and grim the king good sir you can't see him the folks he sees whom he doesn't know must have a proper card to show oh that's all right said teddy g if the king's at home leave that to me our only card is the roosevelt bears and that admits us everywheres the man replied you're a funny sort as off they started across the court they tramped around for half an hour from court to court and tower to tower they stopped the lad to have a talk he was rolling hoops along the walk when teddy g in his merry way picked up the hoops and said good day where do you live your name your age and which do you work at prince or page oh i'm a prince said the little lad and i don't do work neither i nor dad my grandpa's king he's out somewheres hunting the grounds for teddy bears i told him sure to take a gun and if bears he sees to make them run but he said no these bears are good like mother goose or red riding hood or the fairy queen or little bo peep they eat and play and talk and sleep and dress like boys from toe to head they're touring england grandpa said said teddy b there's something loose if i look much like mother goose and no one yet that we have seen would take you for a fairy queen they said to teddy g he was examining his clothes and hat to see if the shakespeare tailor had fixed them right and sewed on the buttons good and tight so you're a prince said teddy g you come with us to the park and we shall help your grandpa look aright for we know these teddy bears by sight so off they went three merry lads whipping the hoops along with gads this way and that through square and park like boys from school off for a lark the king was found down by a stream near the royal dairy where he gets his cream he was giving orders to his hired man when up to his side his grandson ran i found the bears grandpa said he their names are teddy's b and g they told me all about their trip and how sick they were on board the ship and lots of funny things they said which sound like stories i have read but here they are for you to see this brown bear's name is teddy b and the white one's name is teddy g the king gave each a hearty grip and asked them questions about their trip and the strenuous life and what it meant and how they left the president but where's your crown said teddy g i thought that kings wore crowns said he but the king just laughed and said it took a lot of clothes to make one look like the kings one sees in a story book they all sat down on rocks near by to eat a lunch of deep apple pie the english jam and crumpets round and nuts and candy a dozen pound and toast and tea and hot cross buns and hard-boiled eggs and sally luns and cherries ripe and roasted grouse which the king had ordered from the house they talked of things both small and great some long forgotten some up to date they laughed at jokes and spilled their tea and made a muss like you or me said the little prince when lunch was through there's something grandpa i wish you knew he came up close so the king could hear and whispered something in his ear and ended the whisper with a kiss which sounded a little bit like this 
please don't say no. Won't you invite the teddy bears to stay all night? End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonas Houston. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Sam Wharton. Chapter Six. We've reached a very giddy oit, said Teddy B quite late that night. In Windsor Castle, where they slept, in a room a valet said was kept, for kings and queens, for royalty, of the foremost rank and high degree. For don't you know, this violet said, that in this room is kept the bed slept Charles the First, who lost his head, and John and James and Henry eight, and George the Third, whom Yankees hate, and foreign kings and queens a score who came as guests to england's shore it makes me nervous said teddy g to think of those things that might happen to me if i should wake to night in bed and find myself without a head or if to-morrow when you ring you found me turned into a king then what would happen tell me bob with two kings working on the job. But they slept all right in this royal bed, with its curtains canopy overhead. And at nine a.m. on the following day, Teddy G. poked out his head to say to the valet, who had pressed their suits and brushed their hats and shined their boots, Please close the door I didn't ring, for another hour let me be king. And said Teddy G., This place suits me. I slept like a prince and feel like three. As they left for London at noon that day, they thanked the king for the royal way, yet entertained. And they said, If you'll visit us in the USA, when we get back to our home again, and stop with us in our mountain den, we'll give you food and not to do, and let you sleep all winter through, and dream of castles and suck your paws. It beats all the kingdoms you ever saw. The king just laughed as the train pulled out, but he said to himself, as he turned about, It would help me carry my country's cares if every home had teddy bears. We're off to London, said Teddy B, and all of London I want to see. It's famous bridge with the Thames beneath, and Charing Cross and Hampton Heath and the London Tower with its massive keys, and I'd like to see old Cheshire cheese and eat beefsteak, piping pud not, in the very chair on the very spot where Dr. Samuel Johnson sat, while Boswell listened to his chat, and Whittingham I'd like to see, and his famous cat and kittens three. Never mind the kittens, said Teddy G. The thing you name that pleases me is that beefsteak pudding, piping hot, served with onions in a pot. Let's go there first and get it down, and then go out to see the town. And thus they talked as on they went, to London town, a pleasure bent. But where they went, and what they did, would fill tin books from lid to lid. They walked right into the London swim, and saw the town from hub to rim, and made the old place whirl and creak, each day and night for about a week. They scattered money left and right, and stayed up till morning every night. What all the suits, said Teddy B, from the tailor to his majesty. A lot of clothes the king must wear, for one sees this tailor everywhere. If he does us up in London style, Paul Ma will laugh and Bond Street smile. For we'll keep a swath wherever we go, as swell and white as rotten row. The order given, two suits were made which put Fifth Avenue in the shade. They went one day for a rambling walk, to view the town and to have a talk, with boys they met on street and square, about things they noticed here and there. Said Teddy G to a horseman guard, as he gave his name without a card, Good night, good sir, get down, give me your suit, 
from head to toe, from cap to boot. With Teddy B, you stay right here, and let me be a grenadier. The guard obeyed to see the fun, for he knew his horse would enjoy a run, and run he did around a square with Teddy G high up in air, on neck and tail, and upside down, and backwards too like a circus clown. The House of Lords and Commons too had an hour's recess to see him do the cowboy ride as grenadier, and applaud loud with cheer on cheer. That very day they'd lost their way, and lost their guide who lost his pay, and lost the sun, and lost its light, in a London fog as black as night. They lost the stores in handsome cabs, and men they bumped and gave them jabs, and some they scared from head to feet, to meet two bears on the public street. They lost their hats, and Teddy B, his glasses lost and couldn't see, but he saw as well as any bear, for darkness filled in everywhere. The things they saw were shadows black, with lights like ghosts across their track. Which way to turn, or where to go, or what to do, they didn't know. A the thing they heard were whistles loud, for cabs and hansoms for the crowd. But the whistles came, and calls rang out, from overhead and all about, in such a tangle, twist and mix, that all were in the selfsame fix. Teddy G said he would find the street if he had to crawl on hands and feet. And try he did, but he couldn't see. And he lost himself and Teddy B. The last thing heard from him that day, as he rambled off in the fog to stay, was a whistle shrill, then a record shout, to get Sherlock Holmes to help him out. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jonas Houston. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Sam Morton. Chapter 7 That fog was fun, said Terry G. It mixed up every one but me. I shut my eyes and held my feet to find the way from street to street. They simply walked right straight ahead, and brought me to my room and bed. That's what they're for. They seem to know which way to take and where to go, and when to stand and when to jump, and what to dodge and whom to thump. I bumped a duke on public square, and told an earl I didn't care, and trod on lordships everywhere. But here I am, at home complete, and here's credit due to my two feet. The speech he made to Teddy B, who didn't get home till half past three, from an all-night tramp, and tired and sore, and clothes all wet, he never swore. He didn't say, Jove, and don't you know, and Chappy G, that was quite a show, and I'm jolly wet, and a bloomin' bob took me for thief on the street to rob, but I hit him back a little blow, this strenuous sort, the kind we know. And thus they talked till their eyes shut tight about the fun they'd had that night. Teddy G had a scheme to do the tower, the surprising day, at any early hour, to surprise the guard, the beef-eater kind, and his hands and feet to safely bind, and then to take the bunch of keys and go through the tower just as they please. But the things that happened, or even half, would make a cat or a monkey laugh. They can't be told, said Teddy G. But you just wait for a week and see. The Teddy Bears reached London Tower, as they said they would, at an early hour. They made the trip on a London bus, and climbed on top, and made a fuss, with a ticket man, who said that they should take two seats in the law obey, and not stand up and run around to get tumbled off upon the ground. This is not a circus ring, said he, or elephant or Jim Azee. But the bears were out on pleasure bent. An argument wasn't worth a cent. They made that bus a traveling show, down busy streets for a mile or so, while the cheering crowds on the walks below called to each other, 
don't you know? Those teddy bears by Jove and Smart, they're pulling London all apart. But the fun that day had just begun, and it ended up with a lively run. They found their way to the tower gate, and asked the yeoman, guard the rate. By way or week, go for royal board, and the prince of armor, axe and sword, and other things of a confusing kind, while Teddy G reached round behind, and got the keys and bolted quick, and unlocked the massive gate so slick that before the yeoman saw the trick the teddy bears were both inside, locked in the tower without a guide. This tower has history grim and cold of wicked deeds and treachery bold, as black as ever has been told of queens beheaded and children killed, and men imprisoned because they will to speak the truth and priests and peers confined in dungeons for twenty years. And then beheaded, the records say, to make a royal holiday. Its turret walls and gates of fame are monuments to history's shame. But I'm not here, said Teddy G, to study English history. I'm here today to have some fun with royal armor, spit and gun. And fun he had a double share, some fun to keep and some to spare. They found their way to an armored hall where spears and guns lined every wall. And armor suits with faces hard stood round like army men on guard. And some on horses made of wood looked just as though they understand that they must through the ages stand till king or prince gave the command to forward march to face the foe to do or die the victory go. Teddy G walked up to a belted knight and said, I'm ready for a fight. This place is dead. Let you and me take sides and each a general be and choose these soldiers one by one, and give each man a spit and gun, and Teddy B will be the king, and sit up there and direct the thing. We'll make steel flash, and sabers clash, and burst this old tower all to smash. But the knight just grinned through his coat of mail, and the horse didn't even stir his tail. Said Teddy B, Let's try on suits, from helmet down to iron-bound boots, and then load up with spear and shield, and make this floor of a battlefield. They tried the suits on, and Teddy G got dressed in it in iron from head to knee. But, said Teddy B, on a day so hot, a hat of iron built like a pot is armor enough for a teddy bear. This pot is all that I shall wear. They marched around like two dragoons, singing Dixieland and other tunes, the clanging swords and coats of lead, making noise enough to wake the dead. They placed ten armored men in line, who, with shields and spears, looked very fine, and these they drilled for an hour or so, but not a man moved head or toe. When, of this fun, they'd had enough, Teddy G tried hard to, to take off the stuff, but each piece stuck from head to knee, and only his hands and feet were free. He dented his body and lost some hair in changing back from night to bear. But the trouble came as it does in showers, for the yeoman guards were trying for hours to climb outside and scale the wall, and through a window reach the hall to, ca to come upon them unawares and capture alive the teddy bears. But bears can climb, and when they spied the yeoman heads on the other side, they climbed a wall to a window near, and quick as a wink were out and clear. But they landed on a tower nearby, with turrets rough and very high, and before they reached the boundary street they had to jump full twenty feet. T'was then the race of the day began. The bears made tracks and the yeoman ran. But the race was won at the outer gate, when the bear sat down to rest and wait. For said Teddy B to these yeomen brave, It's right to make Taurus behave, But we are here, as you've been told, To make things many for young and old, To prove to all both grave and gay That this world of ours was made for play. The yeoman bowed and said t'was true, That the Tower of London had records few, Where sunshine took the place of shade, And he thanked the bears for the fun they'd made. The following day, they packed their grip and started off on another trip, this time to Paris, to learn the way to parlez-vous and truly be gay. End of chapter 7
Chapter Eight of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Chapter Eight: The Bears in Paris. They studied French along the way on train and steamer to calais and teddy b had learned to say bonjour monsieur and parlez-vous francais and oui for yes and du pain some bread and merci thanks and un lit a bed but on the train that afternoon he pronounced his french in another tune for he ordered hats and shoes to eat and loaves of bread for a parlor seat while teddy g just used his paws and worked his face and tongue and jaws and shook each frenchman long and good till he made his language understood but the fun they had in gay paris was worth an ocean trip to see it would take a week the things to tell and a thousand pictures to do it well they bought new suits of paris style and strolled the boulevards a while and explored the shops and bought some toys to send back home to girls and boys for priscilla alden a special treat a necklace rich and jewel sweet and a watch and chain for muddy pete said teddy b on a public square to a newsboy who was sitting there in a little house in colors bright as he bought some reading for the night is this your shop how much your rent how many centimes in a cent where is your home how old are you what kind of work does your father do we'll pay in english half a crown if you'll show us all around the town or make it frank say two or three if you'll tell us all the things to see but the lad said l'anglais and shook his head and that was every word he said they tried french fun of every sort to the bois they went for a day of sport and sport they had that day at noon for they took a ride in a park balloon tied by a rope five francs a ride you pay your fee and step inside and off you go one thousand feet above the park and lake and street but teddy g said this is low i'll cut the rope and let her go and cut he did and away they flew till the park below was lost to view but down they came in half an hour on the very top of eiffel tower and then to a restaurant to dine where everything was very fine but the place was french with not a hint of english word in voice or print and here it was that teddy g in trying to order a cup of tea and rolls and butter and paris cake made what he calls a big mistake he saw the waiter acting queer and thinking that he couldn't hear he yelled his order in his ear and gave the table such a knock so loud twas heard for half a block he broke a dish and stopped a clock but the frenchman just excited grew for an english word he never knew then teddy b took the menu card and with the language struggled hard and by pointing at things with his paw he ordered every food he saw a meal they say quite big enough two dozen teddy bears to stuff for days and nights they were on the move they saw the luxembourg and louvre the arc of triumph and elysee park and venus of melos and joan of arc and the tuileries and the place vendome and old versailles louis fourteenth's home and napoleon's tomb and the madeleine and bridges of the river seine and the famous store the bon marche where they shopped with children half a day when at versailles said teddy b there's a place out here i'd like to see the trianon if standing yet the homes of marie antoinette where the simple life she led to said was that of a country dairymaid they found the place and there were told of a girlish life of prisons cold of babies stolen of a butchering job a mother killed to please a mob said teddy c don't tell me more of the guillotine and its awful gore i'm here for fun these things i hate i'd wipe all history off the slate with that he made the old place creak playing a game of hide-and-seek with boys and girls who were waiting there to play in french with a teddy bear 
they stopped to get a photograph the comic kind to make folks laugh printed in color and postcard size their tour abroad to advertise they each dressed up in costume grand loaned by the man who owned the stand teddy b the famous richelieu in cardinal's robe of brilliant hue and teddy g as a work of art the great napoleon bonaparte said teddy b this suit of mine makes me look extra super fine said teddy g the whole world knows that a roosevelt bear can fill these clothes the postcards made they bought ten score ten thousand times and fifty more to address and post and send away to boys and girls in the u s a at half past ten o'clock one night they said good-bye to paris light and with basket lunch of bread and jam they took a train for amsterdam end of chapter eight chapter nine of the roosevelt bears abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton chapter nine the roosevelt bears in holland the following day at half past two the roosevelt bears were at waterloo where with a guide they rode around to view this famous battleground to see where great napoleon stood against the world as best he could where his famous old guard true and brave walked straight to death the day to save and where at last the fight was won in the nick of time by wellington with prussians marching night and day to turn the battle england's way but teddy g spoke up and said to the guide who told what he had read you've told enough for we don't care for gory memories anywhere we're here for fun we're off our track touch up your horse and drive us back next day these bears from uncle sam met dutchy hans of amsterdam a little lad with dog and cart driving a load of things to mart said teddy b to little hans whose cart was filled with milk in cans and baskets loaded tight and high with roots to boil and fish to fry we'll go with you along the road and help your dog to pull the load for teddy bears you know can haul and this dog of yours is very small but the boy spoke dutch and his dog did too and not an english word they knew it's strange to me said teddy g how a country lad so small as he can talk with ease while yet so young at breakneck speed a foreign tongue but teddy b the scholar bear said children born here anywhere are all dutch cut in speech and hair but dutchy hans dog seemed glad as the bears took hold to help the lad and off they jogged along the road pulling and pushing the cart and load the bears were now in the strangest land canals and windmills on every hand where dogs work hard from morn till night and women labor with all their might where cows grow horns both round and flat and all the horses are strong and fat where men in baggy trouserette wear wooden shoes to keep out the wet where boys are never known to run and ocean fog shut out the sun where city streets are big canals and boys are named either hans or hals where flowers and birds crowd every tree from amsterdam to zyder z they stopped meanwhile along the road to feed the dogs and rest the load when teddy g said he'd like to try a windmill which they saw near by and wind the old thing up said he to make it go like sixty-three so out they went with dutchy hans and up they climbed on the windmill's hands a bear on each and two hands free going teeter tater see saw see till all at once the wind it blew and round and round the old thing flew like sixty-three and ninety-eight so fast they couldn't count the gate the farmers crowded near the tower to see the windmill grind their flour with teddy bears going round and round so quick they couldn't see the ground at last the wind let up a bit and the bears got off on the tower to sit 
said teddy b let's go below my head and feet are swimming so but teddy g just laughed and said the wheels have not yet reached my head that fun was great and the flour we ground let's get it cooked and passed around the farmer's wife gave each a seat and brought out biscuits thick to eat and talked in dutch in a pleasant way of roosevelt bears and america the things she said they supposed were true and they answered back as though they knew they talked to a lad as on they went whose feet were tired and whose back was bent carrying a load two baskets big heaped full enough for horse and rig said teddy g give me your load i'll carry it along the road i like to share both work and play with boys and girls along the way the lad looked pleased but the dutch he spoke came out in chunks big enough to choke that talks all right said teddy g you come along this road with me and on they went two boys two bears one little dog two loads of wares at amsterdam they bade good day to the lads they met along the way and gave them each some cash to pay for lunch to eat and games to play then off they rambled round the town to study dutch and write it down they stopped to view on a public square a famous rembrandt statue there and to read his life and study art and rest their legs for another start end of chapter nine chapter ten of the roosevelt bears abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by twinkle the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton chapter ten the roosevelt bears in germany at a custom house on a boundary line the teddy bears had to pay a fine when a dozen pistols tumbled out of their traveling grips and fell about said the officer in a voice severe these shooting arms which i see here will give you trouble they break the law they'll get you jailed from nose to paw but he spoke in german and shook his head and the bears didn't catch just what he said so teddy b to be polite held up the pistols the way men fight and snapped the triggers and laughed to boot to show the man that they wouldn't shoot the german officer ducked his head and people took to their heels and fled before they knew just what twas for like an army beaten in time of war a report was sent to the head police that two teddy bears had broken the peace and were shooting people left and right and had taken possession of all in sight and were marching then to take the town and pull the german standard down the police filed out a hundred strong and cleared the streets of an angry throng and word was sent to the emperor to call the army and prepare for war and to shine up the navy without delay and load up supplies and steam away the german emperor gave the word and a million men with gun and sword rushed through the country from end to end the german honor to defend but in half an hour peace reigned again for the teddy bears said they'd explain and explain they did and paid a fine for carrying arms across the line and this message too they sent by wire to the emperor whom they admire we are sorry sir for a big mistake it proved your army was wide awake when you have trouble in a row the roosevelt bears will show you how for we have pluck and nerve and grit and best of all no one to hit said teddy g as their train they took let's write this up for our story book for of all the jokes of every size this one today takes the biggest prize they had fun in germany at every stop on carriage drives in street and shop they sat one day a show to see in a garden place and ordered tea when the waiter brought two steins of beer and said 
That's what we serve folks here. Teddy G. took his and spilled it out, and went himself to a fountain spout, and filled the stein with water cold, and drank as much as he could hold, while Teddy B. made a gruff grimace, and blew the froth in the waiter's face, and gave him orders sharp and clear. That twas tea he wanted, not lager beer. Another day, on a city street, a dog got caught in a soldier's feet, with Teddy G. holding tight the string, while the owner crossed the street to bring his two little boys the bears to meet, and to get some pretzels the five to treat. But the soldier, with his suit so swell, tripped on the string and nearly fell, and stepped on the dog and made him yell, and told Teddy G. beat him well, with the sword and saber, shot and shell, if he didn't stop his Yankee talk, and get down on his knees and off the walk. But Teddy G. just stood his ground, and made the soldier walk around, and then he laughed and danced to clog, and played some tricks with the boys and dog, and sang a song which pleased them much, it takes the Yankees to beat the Dutch. They saw the empire east and west, and were given welcome the very best, in cities large and hamlets small, in wayside inn, in banquet hall, on country road and everywhere. The Germans welcomed the teddy bears. The mistakes they made from day to day were all because of their merry way. For a hundred miles they sailed the Rhine. On a day when the weather was warm and fine, they enjoyed the sights of castles old, built high on hills by barons bold. They saw a church in old Cologne, five hundred feet of massive stone, with double spires and gothic style. The finest architectural pile, in all the world, the guidebooks say, built by the peasants a place to pray, near the vine-clad hills of Bingen Fair. Some students who had gathered there sang loud and full, led by a band, Wassistes, Dutch and Vaterland, while the Roosevelt Bears made jubilee and sang, My country, tis of thee. And then the boys, their spirits gay, sang, Wach dem Rhein, in a splendid way. So well, the bears their voices cleared, took off their hats, and loudly cheered. One day, near the close of the German week, the bears were resting beside a creek, far in a forest where they strayed, enjoying the streams in restful shade when all at once a rifle shot went whizzing by the very spot where Teddy B. sat by a tree, reading a book on Germany. The bears jumped up and dodged around, from tree to tree and mound to mound, till through the trees and up the glen they spied a dozen hunter-men, hurrying towards them on a trot to gather the game which they had shot said Teddy B. to the chief command, I want you, good sir, to understand that your aim is bad and your manners worse, and your conduct, sir, we won't endorse. But the man who fired was a royal sport, and he took the bears to his forest court, and entertained them day and night, and treated them both square and white. And when they left, he said, I'll see, that the Roosevelt bears receive from me the freedom of all of Germany. The bears regretted they couldn't remain, and the following day they took a train and rode all night in a palace car to St. Petersburg to see the Tsar. End of chapter 10《ハッピーエンドで、ロズベルトベアスアブロード》。これは、LibriVox のレコーディングです。全ての LibriVox のレコーディングは、LibriVox のホームページにあります。詳しい情報は、LibriVox.org に行ってください。以上、ベティ・ビー。ロズベルトベアスアブロード。By the Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton。ハッピーエンドで、The Roosevelt Bears in Russia。The teddy bears learned a thing or two about the way the Russians do. For about ten o'clock the following day, at a railway station along the way, 
their clothes were searched in boots and caps umbrellas overcoats and traps by whiskered men who used them rough and talked in language loud and gruff what the search was for they didn't know or if mistaken for foreign foe and when teddy g gave a man a blow for prodding him behind the ear with the sharpest end of a soldier's spear it opened battle then and there between officer and teddy bear but the roosevelt bears knew how to box and teddy g worked off some knocks the shoulder kind the twisty stuff till the russian cried he'd had enough but in russia france or anywhere for me or you for teddy bear to fight for peace isn't worth a dime it doubles trouble every time or the stronger wins and peace is made because the weaker is afraid things move more happily along if we apologize when in the wrong but that row that day had gone too far the bears were ordered off the car and men were called like soldiers dressed with chains and cuffs to make arrests the bears regretted the row they'd made and tried the officers to persuade that no harm was meant but all was fun as they had no spear or sword or gun but to hit a soldier is a serious crime which must not be done at any time and two sets of handcuffs did the trick and the teddy bears were landed quick in a russian jail with a window each through which to coax or scold or teach the noisy crowd which stood below laughing and joking at the show but in that crowd was a yankee tar whose cruiser captain knew the czar and he took a message from teddy b which in half an hour got both bears free and a special train on which to ride with dining car and russian guide and friendly help on every side and stations passed along the way displaying the flag of the u s a when they reached st petersburg that night this famous city was a blaze of light from streets of granite laid in mire to the top of every golden spire streams of light shone everywhere in honor of the roosevelt bears and russian soldiers all in line made the city squares look very fine as they were driven in carriage grand led by a famous russian band to a fine hotel on the palace quay where they were told that all was free their rooms and board and service best and lounging parlors in which to rest and carriages at their command and music from the czar's own band and all their own not a cent to pay as many days as they chose to stay they read the lives of peter the great and of his successors up to date as wicked a bunch as ever made the countries of the world afraid they learned that hundreds thousands died in building the streets on every side from damp and cold on this marshy site because king peter's word was might they read how catherine's foes were slain to clear the way for her to reign and how she made men live like swine that she herself might in glory shine and other histories stern and grim of people killed for royal whim and thousands banished to regions cold children in arms and peasants old for trifling cause or none at all to please some upstart ruler small these things made teddy g so cross he left the house and walked across a bridge or two in a public square to find the famous russian bear to teach him he said his a b c and how to govern fair and free he taught that bear enough that day to make his hair turn red or gray the way to spell the roosevelt plan o x for ox and a n for ann which easy way to spell said he the russians need much more than we he taught him figures how to divide with folks in need on every side and government the way to plan was to take some lessons from japan and in geography on a world so small said teddy g don't take it all but what you have just hold and rule and build for every child a school the russian bear did the best he could and said he thought he understood but teddy g made him promise true that he'd read the life of roosevelt through and then take up when that was done the history of george washington one afternoon at half past five they took the czar for a little ride to show him the city about which he said he had often in his castle read teddy b said he would drive her be 
and charge by the hour and collect the fee while teddy g was to sit behind the famous russian czar to mind the streets were crowded and windows high to see the bears go driving by and to cheer the czar and throw bouquets the kind which start a russian blaze but teddy g with arm and paw knocked off with ease each bomb he saw and did his part so brave and well in handling safely every shell that he won a medal with printing filled he saved a king from getting killed they left the city of historic strife to learn a little of russian life to see the farms of grain and grass and study the ways of the peasant class they spent a day with a man whose name is known to literature and fame and talked with him and tried his clothes and hoed his corn a dozen rows and heard him explain his patent trick how to make wrong right and do it quick next week we'll go said teddy b to switzerland her hills to see and we'll climb each one and never stop till we stand alone on the very top and colorado's mountains cheer our brother bears and mountain deer and every rock and creek and tree and all our friends across the sea end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the roosevelt bears abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton chapter twelve the roosevelt bears in switzerland the bears were now in switzerland with snowy peaks on every hand and winding roads and lakes of blue and mountain sides of every hue and waterfalls and deep ravines and ever-changing landscape scenes with sky for roof and farms for floors for switzerland is all outdoors at bern the capital they saw the famous bears and shook each paw and with the cubs they had some fun and gave them views of washington and made them promise that some day they'd spend a summer in the u s a then at lucerne they spent a week and rode to the top of each mountain peak up riggy in a puffing train and stanzerhorn pulled by a chain and old piletus in a car which beat the ride with the russian czar for it made their hair stand straight on end as they curved around each mountain bend but when they reached Pilatus's peak they looked amazed and didn't speak for all about them here unfurled the grandest view in all the world a mountain goat who made his home on the very crest of this mighty dome made friends with each and showed surprise that bears should climb so near the skies at stanzerhorn they tried a trick to ride the mountain double quick in a baggage truck which teddy g shoved off a siding just to see the old thing whiz along said he it whizzed along for a hundred yards when it hit a stone and smashed the guards and tossed the bear's head over paw the worst upset you ever saw but bears have luck and they struck a rock and all they got was a nervous shock and some words in french which sounded cross from a gruffish man the station boss they saw the lion of lucerne who arrow pierced in visage stern defends with paw his country's shield to commemorate a battlefield they rode on boats from place to place and drove around each mountain base they stopped at call of chapel bell to hear the story of william tell and here it was that teddy g bought bow and arrow just to see if at a hundred feet or more he could hit an apple in the core the apple was laid by teddy b on top of his head and entirely free the arrow shaved his nose a bit and struck the core and the apple split while the crowd of peasants cheered them well and said it equalled william tell from interlaken where was seen the jungfrau famous alpine queen they took a drive up a deep ravine till they reached the ice a glacier white which glistened in the midday light twas here in a cave that teddy g ordered ice water instead of tea but because the cave was cool and nice they charged him extra for the ice and ice around them where they stood 
five million tons and clear and good at quaint zermatt they rose one morn to view the peak of matterhorn and to see the sun get out of bed and light the snow a brilliant red at chamonix they spent a day and hired a guide to show the way to climb mount blanc that famous peak of which so many tourists speak with alpenstock and rope and pick and the things folk need to do the trick they started out like climbers bold to risk their necks and endure the cold to climb all day and never stop till they landed at the very top but of all the climbs they ever had and all the upsets good and bad on cowboy horse on western track or in circus ring on camel's back or an old balloon or omaha or with farmer's bull round stack of straw or with shakespeare deer in charlotte coat or out on the ocean on the boat this climb that day for fright and fun beat everything they had ever done in half a day they had lost their way and which route to take they couldn't say and to add to the trouble said teddy g i couldn't catch hold of stone or tree and my shoe slipped off the slippery lid and i fell on the ice and rolled and slid one time i nearly went below in a thousand feet of ice and snow but the guide stuck fast to the rock above and teddy b pulled and i tried to shove and they got me landed safe at last on a ledge of rock where they tied me fast and all night long there set the three like crows on top of a hemlock tree next day when they landed safe and sound back in the town at their starting ground said teddy b let us view that slope from where we stand through that telescope and when they paid for what they saw and the little old man shook each bear's paw said teddy g to some tourists there please take the advice of a teddy bear and when mont blanc its height sublime you have ambition keen to climb just come round here and take a peep and say to yourself the mount will keep i'd rather twice ride a balloon or go on a journey to the moon switzerland said teddy b has fun and fame enough for me but before i turn my feet towards home i want to let them stand in rome rome's all right said teddy g but turkey's the place i want to see and egypt too and the pyramids and on the way those spartan kids End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of the roosevelt bears abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton chapter thirteen the roosevelt bears in rome at florence the bears stopped off a day to see the city which tourists say is built on grand artistic lines and crowded full of famous shrines these artists fellows said teddy g what have they done for you and me you cannot find here anywhere a painting of a teddy bear i saw some dogs and a lion or two but not a sketch of me or you then teddy b laughed loud and said if you your Baedeker had read you'd know that when great artists paint they take their model from a saint but now they're painting girls instead for all the famous saints are dead but here i'm told many years ago lived the famous michelangelo and dante too and many more whose names are known the whole world o'er there's a statue here i want to see of galileo whose geography was the first to prove to scholars all that the world is round like a rubber ball an english boy who heard their chat as they on a florence curbstone sat told them just how and where to go to get a look at galileo from naples the teddy bears went out to old vesuvius to see its spout they took a sail on the bay to see the famous island of capri where caesar made a beauty bower and tiberius built a handsome tower twas here that a little beggar lad with clothes and rags the best he had asked teddy g about the u s a and chums of his who went that way in broken words he made it known 
that he was now left all alone his father dead and mother too and scarcely any work to do and not a friend to help him through teddy g got busy pretty quick with his money bag and did the trick he gave the lad in coins of gold as much as both his hands would hold to help him across the ocean wide and to find his chums on the other side the bears had school next day in rome like college boys whom they knew at home studying latin and wasting time on caesar's history and virgil's rhyme teddy g got mad and cross and sore and threw the books around the floor i'd like to know just why he said boys study stuff so old and dead when every day from eight till five men have to work with things alive you don't know school said teddy b they teach these things because you see the teachers know that dead things last and they like ruins live in the past but teddy g didn't seem to care my school he said is the open air so off he went with teddy b the seven hills of rome to see and the river tiber where horatius stood and held the bridge as best he could a roman brave against a horde of tuscans armed with spear and sword and old st peter's where they bowed with heads uncovered with the crowd and the appian way with ruins lined and memorial arches well designed and the Colosseum where they say to make a roman holiday lions and bears by scores were slain as in bullfight shows of modern spain said teddy b these roman kings were great on building circus rings but teddy g asked like a clown how they moved the thing from town to town they saw the place where caesar stood when cassius drew his roman blood they asked a roman standing there if he thought that brutus acted fair and here it was that teddy g in roman toga as mark antony recited the shakespeare line so well that the crowd about began to yell and shout for vengeance then and there because caesar wasn't treated square but in rome they didn't mean to stay for the teddy bears were out for play and these moss-grown ruins said teddy b are not worth half so much to me as a mountain brook or a forest tree they had a letter from a yankee lad who lived in venice with his dad inviting them to spend a day with him in his own venetian way End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of the roosevelt bears abroad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton chapter fourteen the roosevelt bears in venice the yankee lad who wrote to rome inviting the bears to his venice home he lived in venice a year or two and many gondoliers he knew and the grand canal from end to end and the famous buildings at every bend and the city squares like patchwork quilt and the hundred islands on which it's built and the ducal palace he knew it well and the campanile where it fell and old st mark's with its glittering dome surpassing all the sights of rome and the famous horses by kingdoms loaned which nero and napoleon owned and many homes both old and new where byron lived and browning too and titian's home on a canal aside and the home where wagner lived and died but i like better said this yankee chap than anything on the venetian map a dozen boys whom i'll invite to come with me to the train to-night to meet the bears with gondolas gay with flags to wave and guitars to play to give them welcome and help he said to paint the town of venetian red the train arrived the bears were there no cab or street car anywhere but the dozen lads and the gondoliers gave welcome with three hearty cheers then off the jolly party went up the grand canal on pleasure bent for venice looks her best at night when the moon sheds forth her fullest light they had heaps of fun and lots to eat and things to see and friends to meet 
the whole night through was spent in sport and boyish pranks of every sort the following day the bears went out with the yankee lad to stroll about when a careless step by teddy b landed him in the adriatic sea or the grand canal or the big lagoon he didn't know which but he got there soon and teddy g who thought that he was trying the water just to see if warm enough for a summer swim made a fancy dive and followed him then a shout went up from a gondolier as he saw the two bears disappear the police and boats rushed swift along and soon there gathered a noisy throng but presently up came two bears their mouths filled full of dirt and swears at least with growls which sounded bad for both their faces looked pretty mad the water was hardly fit to drink and if not so thick would make yellow ink said teddy g when his tongue would talk as he pulled himself on the marble walk that water i swallowed just now i say tastes all the world like consomme that's not the soup said teddy b you're getting things mixed it's puree of pea whatever it is teddy g called out it's rich in taste and good and stout then off they ran to change their suits from nose to paw from cap to boots they hired a gondola that afternoon and sailed for hours around the lagoon and up canals both large and small till on towards night they struck a squall when rounding a point near the eastern end where the sea comes up in graceful bend their gondola rolled and tossed and tipped and half upset and water dipped but teddy g who pulled the oar was a captain brave and made the shore they said as they landed tired and wet that gondola ride was the best thing yet teddy g dressed up in venetian style and went out on the street for a little while with new guitar to serenade and to show how yankee tunes are played a crowd of boys at every square cheered long and loud for the teddy bear and old folks too when the bear they saw came crowding round to shake his paw they closed their week with fun and noise by giving a picnic to the yankee boys a launch was hired by the teddy bears and three gondolas with seats and chairs all fastened together with the launch ahead and colored banners blue and red and stars and stripes and stuff to eat the jolliest kind of picnic treat the wheel was taken by teddy b and the engine run by teddy g and they made things go like sixty-three the jolliest picnic we ever had and the happiest day said every lad let's try a sail on the deep blue sea for a day or two said teddy g i'm tired of stones and buildings dead and should like to try the sea instead so twas agreed and off they flew in a little boat on the waters blue with an oar to steer and a single sail to speed them along in storm or gale they took some lunch they bought the best and a compass to tell them east and west and their bags and traps and gifts they bought and a stove to cook if fish they caught and a chart to show the waters deep and a rug or two on which to sleep but a gale came up that very night and carried the two bears out of sight. End of chapter 14、Chapter、15チャプター15ザ・ロゾベルト・ベーズ・イン・エジプト。The sea was rough and the wind was stiff, and the bears were blown in their little skiff, far out from the Adriatic Sea, on the most famous waters of history. For days and nights not a thing was seen, neither ship nor rock nor mountain green, until one morning when daylight broke, they saw on the horizon a puff of smoke. And later, when the day grew bright, an ocean steamer hove in sight, and as luck would have it, came their way, cutting aside the ocean spray. They signaled the ship as best they could, till the captain their signals understood. He stopped the engines as near they came, 
and called to the bears to give their name and from what port and how long at sea and the meaning of teddy's b and g the bears explained their story brief and asked the captain to send relief relief it came and that ship that day floated the flag of the u s a and gave the bears a welcome grand as good as anything they had on land the ship was bound for a southern port and the following day the egyptian court gave audience to the teddy bears and told them the best they had was theirs passes for trains and for the river nile steamers to take them every mile and at every town a free hotel and a guide who could talk the english well they were now in egypt whose fame was won six thousand years before washington the land where the dead alone are great whose century records its stones relate the land where the pharaohs lived and ruled where moses in leadership was schooled and euclid too where tis said that he invented the problems of geometry the land of obelisks upon which appear the ages records in figures queer the land where pyramids built high of stones are big enough to hold the bones of all the kings they ever had for six thousand years both good and bad the land where cleopatra reigned the famous queen who entertained antony and caesar and for her smile was named the enchantress of the nile the land of the sphinx whose broken face tells very little about his race the land where skies are always fair where men ride donkeys everywhere but said teddy g dead things don't count this dromedary here i'll mount and show these arabs that a yankee bear can make the sand fly anywhere and mount he did and ride in style down a cairo street for half a mile and when he stopped he was asked to try scores of camels and each to buy i'm not a circus said teddy g and don't care to buy more than two or three he did buy two a beauty cream and a chocolate brown to make a team and these he ordered shipped for fun to a little lad in washington said teddy g to a bedouin lad who was selling water which tasted bad please name your donkey and state a price and give me a drink with a little ice the lad replied as quick as a wink yankee doodle's the name now have a drink and this pleased teddy g so much he said these bedouins beat the dutch and he gave the lad sufficient pay to keep him in change for many a day the teddy bears talked long one day with an egyptian mummy that's what they say and asked him how he liked the show so many thousand years ago the kind of shoes and ties he wore and if his collar buttons rolled on the floor if boys played hooky then from school and if men obeyed the golden rule at what he worked and how much pay and how many meals he ate each day if girls wore hats away back so far with feathers and flowers like a cheap bazaar and other questions of a curious kind by which the bears tried hard to find if six thousand years in time and place made any difference in the race the mummy laughed said teddy g till he split his face into two or three but his tongue was mum on history a drawing was made by teddy b of the bears climbing up the sphinx to see if he would talk and the secret tell how some folks by luck got on so well while others worked and their lifetime spent like toiling treadmills which nowhere went but the sphinx was silent and stared ahead and looked as though all his folks were dead he didn't smile he didn't wink nor muscle move nor seem to think while teddy g spoke in his ear a joke or two and some words of cheer we must go home said teddy b and all our friends in the mountain sea a steamer sails this week they say which will take us back to the u s a and let us off for two days in spain where a ride is planned on a special train which will take us to the spanish court and bring us back to gibraltar fort said teddy g it will be a happy day when we get back to the u s a but of all the things that upset me the one that's worst is a wobbly sea. End of chapter 15
Chapter Sixteen of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Chapter Sixteen The Bears Return from Abroad. Hurrah, hurrah, said Teddy B and now for home across the sea back to the land where girls and boys keep teddy bears for chums and toys across the prairie with its fields of corn to the mountain den where we were born i won't hurrah said teddy g till we get across this wobbly sea the bears were now on an ocean ship which was cutting the waves at a record clip flags were flying from every spar and streamers blowing from rocks afar put there by boys who climbed up high to wave to the bears a last good-bye telegrams and letters from every court were put on board at gibraltar's fort messages from kings and at least a score from czars and emperors and many more from famous queens and princes young and a thousand letters in every tongue from boys and girls whom they had seen in cities and towns where they had been and medals too in bronze and gold as many as a good-sized bag would hold and gifts and boxes of every sort were sent on board at gibraltar's port so many the ship was delayed a day to get them loaded and stowed away they wired their thanks to king and czar and to boys and girls both near and far and promised true that they would write from their mountain den some winter night when out at sea they had lots of fun telling stories and jokes to every one about things that happened and what they saw and how once or twice they broke the law at a concert given on board one night they beat all performers out of sight by the tricks they did and songs they sung and by imitating each foreign tongue when the ship ran into a stormy sea they didn't get sick like you or me but did their best in their jolly way to make a wobbly ship both smooth and gay when they reached new york twas the greatest day at least that's what the papers say that was ever seen in a hundred years for flags and crowds and welcome cheers a grand parade with a hundred bands and crowds of children on a thousand stands and every window in the streets below packed with people to see the show and all to welcome teddy's b and g back to their native country as they stepped from the ship to a carpet stand the first to take them by the hand was uncle sam that jolly soul with his yankee suit and face so droll his speech was short but generous we want you back you belong to us then in a carriage up broadway through cheering crowds and gay display went the teddy bears their faces bright both bowing to children left and right at union square right in the street whom should they meet but muddy pete the newsboy guide whom they longed to see the carriage was stopped and teddy g got out on the walk and hugged the lad and kissed him twice he felt so glad next day when they met on the public street teddy g gave gifts to muddy pete which filled his arms heaped up at that and pockets too and blouse and hat at a banquet given in a big hotel the teddy bears were asked to tell of their trip abroad and or things they saw and of kings and queens who shook their paw teddy g was called on first to speak but public speaking to him was greek so with a jolly story and a joke or two and thanks all around his speech was through but teddy b spoke long and loud and was applauded often by the crowd toastmaster and gentlemen said he and then right back in history he made a start and plain and bold the story of the teddy bears he told how bears were shot and hunted down and chased to the woods from every town how children too were told the lie that bears would eat them if they should cry how hunters bold acted off the square when they shot and killed a mother bear and let the baby cubs go free to starve to death in a hollow tree his speech that night brought forth applause and a petition signed to amend the laws and make it a crime of a serious sort to kill an animal just for sport 
End of chapter 16「Seventeen of the Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Chapter 17. The Roosevelt Bears Visit Canada and Complete Their Foreign Tour the bears were given a special train to take them west and home again this time through canada to go to sport a little with ice and snow for autumn's months were almost gone and winter had her snowsuit on they reached toronto the following day where they were escorted to the bay by the queen's own band and grenadiers while boys and girls with songs and cheers and waving flags lined yong and king and made the old town fairly sing the stars and stripes and union jack and bunting all along the track made the gayest night which they had seen since their call on england's king and queen the bay was frozen and friends of theirs had planned some fun for the teddy bears a race on skates and an ice-boat ride to show the way canadians glide from place to place in zero air and to teach the sport to each teddy bear there was fun that day when teddy g got off on skates to show that he could figures cut and racers beat as easily as on paws or feet he cut some figures eights and nines with extra curves and added lines he skipped some spots just here and there when his head was down and his feet in air and once he slid right by so fast the excited crowd just stood aghast thinking each minute he'd break his head or split in two by an awful spread for his feet just went one straight northeast and the other pointing west the least he landed one square on his back and slid along a slippery track till stopped by a lad who said that he would show him figures two or three teddy g said no it's very nice but i've had enough of slippery ice next time i skate i want a pair of skates placed on me everywhere teddy b was wise and took his slide with a little boy on either side holding his paws and changing feet first left then right in figures neat but the biggest fun they had that day on the winter ice of toronto bay was the ice boat race and the way twas won when the teddy bears beat every one they ran that boat at a frightful rate tipped with a breeze on a single skate and some folks say that in a squall they didn't touch the ice at all but simply sailed right through the air more like a bird than a teddy bear they spent some hours in going the rounds of shops and streets and college grounds then off they started to montreal for a carnival and winter ball and there to try the city's pride the great mount royal toboggan slide they dressed themselves from head to paw in the prettiest suits you ever saw of knitted wool in white and red with the trailing cap covering ears and head to see those bears go down that chute at a speed which no one could compute and to hear them yell as past they flew down that toboggan avenue was jolly fun and a treat for all and worth a trip to montreal these canadian lads said teddy b lead reckless lives it seems to me with skates for shoes and lightning sleds they make things easy for bumping heads said teddy g the thing that's wrong is walking back it takes so long i wish i had a toboggan slide to take me back to our mountain side i'd build a fire to warm my toes for both my feet are nearly froze next day the bears went for a tramp with a snowshoe club to a winter camp where under boughs of spruce and pine was spread a table with cooking fine which made teddy g just say that he would then and there a canadian be they stopped at ottawa a day to the governor their respects to pay and then by swiftest c p train they crossed this great northwest domain to winnipeg where a day or so they stopped to see the city grow and while they stayed the papers said the city went right straight ahead and grew so fast on its prairie site that its area doubled overnight
End of section 17. Chapter 18 of The Roosevelt Bears Abroad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The Roosevelt Bears Abroad by Seymour Eaton. Chapter 18 The Teddy Bears Arrive Home. But how they journeyed on from there or by what route or when or where has not been told for the teddy bears slept nights and days in beds and chairs and only waked when jolt or jar or call for dinner in the dining car made them sit up and wonder when they'd reach their own snug mountain den as they approached the place where they were born teddy g blew loud on a trumpet horn a west point bugle call he knew and a hundred friends came into view for the news had scattered far and wide when the bears would reach the mountainside the crowd had come from far and near to welcome back two friends so dear the old bobcat with the bandaged knee was the first to shake with teddy b and a young cougar and a panther bold helped teddy g his load to hold and many more gave welcome hand to the most famous bears in all the land their friends had planned a jubilee and lanterns hung from every tree and fires were burning here and there and all was bustle everywhere the midnight supper these friends had planned and the music from a wildcat band and the singing by a squirrel choir and the stories told around the fire delighted teddies b and g and made them happy as they could be the following day in their mountain den the bears were tucked up warm again and teddy g in a cosy heap was curled like a muff and sound asleep when teddy b shook him and said i got a plan in a book i read of the thing to do when next we wake then he gave teddy g another shake two smart detectives we shall be and solve for children all mystery troubles they have of every kind or treasures lost they cannot find or problems which they cannot do or things they know which can't be true we'll work for fun and charge no fee please stop your talk said teddy g i want to sleep if your plan is good don't tell it to all the neighborhood end of chapter eighteen end of the roosevelt bears abroad by seymour eaton